The Adani Group, one of India's biggest conglomerates, has come under fire from a small American investment firm called Hindenburg Research. The firm run by Nathan Anderson is known for uncovering issues at companies like Nikola Corporation, Clover Health and Lordstown Motors. You may not be familiar with the Adani Group or its founder, Gautam Adani, but in India he's a household name, having briefly surpassed Jeff Bezos as the world's second richest man. As India continues to grow as one of the world's largest economies, Adani has become the face of its fast-paced growth. Adani's journey began as a diamond sorter in Bombay after dropping out of school as a teenager. He then built India's largest conglomerate, the Adani Group, with interests in sectors ranging from infrastructure and data to defense, media, mining and green energy. The Adani Group is a major player in India's economy, responsible for a fifth of the nation's electricity transmission and a fifth of the cement industry. Adani's companies also own key infrastructure like roads, airports and ports, and store a third of India's grain in their warehouses. The Adani Group, which derives much of its revenues from mining and burning coal, has vowed to become one of the world's largest green energy businesses by investing $70 billion by 2030 in everything from green hydrogen to solar panel manufacturing. Adani is one of the largest employers and taxpayers in India, meaning that accusations of fraud matter to the country, its financial markets, its regulators and politicians. Questions about Gautam Adani's personal integrity really matter too, because of his long-standing association with India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who comes from the same state of Gujarat. The strength of Adani's political connections were highlighted back in 2014 when Modi flew in Adani's jet after winning the election. This whole saga began on January 24 when Hindenburg Research tweeted out, quote, soon we'll release a report on what we strongly suspect to be the largest corporate fraud in history. The tweet went viral and after a lot of guessing, Hindenburg released their report on Adani Group. The Hindenburg report was possibly the most read document in India the week of its release. It was read by every bank and every financial institution in the country. And from the people I speak to there, I get the impression that it dominates every conversation. The release of the report caused Adani companies to fall in value by over 50% in the next few days. A classic David and Goliath story is playing out right now between this small investment firm and one of the wealthiest, most politically connected men in the world, and it's not at all clear how it'll end. Before I dig into the allegations, the evidence and the responses, let me tell you about today's video sponsor, Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that helps you understand the most important ideas in over 5,500 different books and podcasts in around 15 minutes each. You can either read or play the books on your phone. The creators at Blinkist are great at extracting the most important concepts and ideas from a book and making them really entertaining. I often find myself buying more books than I've time to read. With Blinkist, I can listen to lots of new titles on my commute, and if I find one really interesting, then read the full book. Blinkist is amazing for refreshing my memory of a book too that I've read a while back. Here are some of the books I'm currently listening to. They have a new feature called Blinkist Connect, which allows every Blinkist premium plan to be shared by two different accounts. It's no additional cost to you, and it's free to the person you invite for as long as you're sharing it with them. 2023 is the year for you to become who you want to be, and Blinkist is here to guide you. Get 40% off Blinkist Premium, only valid till the end of February. Enjoy two memberships for the price of one. Start your seven day free trial by clicking the link in the description box or scanning the QR code. Okay, so what is the Adani Group accused of? Well, quite a lot actually. Hindenburg, who claimed to have spent two years on their investigation, accused Adani of being engaged in brazen stock manipulation and accounting fraud. 
Hindenburg calls Adani the largest con in corporate history, saying that the shares are wildly overvalued because of stock price manipulation using offshore funds. They claim that the company's financing is very, very shallow and that the entire enterprise is thus at risk of failure. Hindenburg says that Adani doesn't have enough money to meet its current obligations. These are big accusations. A lot of the stock manipulation accusations hinge on the role that Gautama Adani's older brother Vino has allegedly played using a network of offshore entities that he allegedly controls. Some of these companies conceal their ultimate ownership through nominee directors and almost exclusively hold shares in Adani companies. The report says that one such entity is London-based Ilara, a firm it claims holds $3 billion in Adani stocks, with one of its funds having 99% of its assets in Adani. Lord Joe Johnson, the former Conservative Minister and brother of former UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, resigned as director of Ilara Capital on the 1st of February, a few days after this report was released. He told the press, I now recognize that this is a role that requires greater domain experience in specialized area of financial regulation than I anticipated, and accordingly I have resigned from the board. Hindenburg highlighted as a red flag Adani's use of a tiny firm in India as one of its main auditors. But it's not just in India. Last year, Adani shifted the audit of its British subsidiaries from a big four firm to Crow UK, the uh, 12th largest auditor in the UK. It doesn't help his case that Adani has already been in trouble for stock manipulation. There was a 2007 ruling against the firm that found that it had worked with a notorious stock manipulator to boost its stock price. Members of Gautam Adani's family, who are also executives within the Adani group of companies, also have a history of being investigated for fraud and stock market schemes in the past, and this is all detailed in the report. In the report, Hindenburg alleges that Adani Group has engaged in stock price manipulation and accounting fraud over the course of decades, and it presents a list of 88 questions related to those allegations, which we hope the Adani Group will be pleased to answer, they say. The report raises questions about the group's heavily debt-fueled growth model. It alleges that a relative of Adani used offshore entities to launder money into the group's listed companies. This, it claims, contributed to the price surge that took the businesses to sky-high valuations. Even if you ignore the findings of the investigation, the firm suggests Adani's seven key listed companies, four of which have price earnings ratios in the hundreds, have 85% downside purely on a fundamental basis owing to sky high valuations. Hindenburg announced that they have taken a short position on Adani Group companies through US listed bonds and non Indian traded derivative instruments. Aswat Damodaran of NYU reviewed the report and commented on Twitter, The Adani Group has too much substance to be a con, but it has exploited the weakest links in the India story. Family groups that put control first, a financial market where bullish momentum trading is prized, and inertia-bound and political institutions. He goes on to say, I think that the group has played fast and loose with listing rules, used intra-party transactions to make itself look more creditworthy, and worked its political connections. But if those comprise a con, it has a lot of company in India. Now we have a lot more to dig into. We need to consider the motivations of Hindenburg research. We need to discuss the capital raising that Adani was trying to do on the day that the report was released. We need to discuss how Adani responded to the allegations. And we need to discuss how a scandal like this could affect the overall economy of India. First, though, let's talk about Adani's political connections and how they might have aided in his rise to becoming Asia's richest man. 
The rise of Gautama Dhani started when he offered support to the then Chief Minister of Gujarat, Narendra Modi, back in 2003. At the time, Modi was being heavily criticized for failing to control violent riots that had rocked the state a year earlier. Adani publicly broke ranks with the business elite, defending Modi and potentially risking his future for the under-fire politician. After that, as Modi rose in politics, his friend Adani rose in the world of business, and there have, of course, been accusations of corruption. As an example, when the Indian government approved the privatization of six airports in 2018, the rules were changed allowing companies with no experience in the aviation sector to bid. Gautam Adani, an industrialist with no history of running airports, scooped up all six airports. Overnight, Adani became one of the country's biggest private airport operators. Adani has acknowledged in interviews with the press that his approach of aligning business interests to government policy has given him a tailwind, but that he's always worked within the law. Adani doesn't deny having been a champion of Modi's agenda and has pumped billions of dollars into areas that the government designated as priorities. These have included simultaneously investing in mining coal, which India needs to meet fast-growing power demand, and renewable power, a longer-term priority as India sets ambitious targets to decarbonize its economy. Now, Indian opposition MPs have long been suspicious of the tight relationship between Adani and Modi and have demanded that the country's market regulator and stock exchange address the allegations being made by Hindenburg. So who is Hindenburg? Hindenburg Research is a short-selling activist hedge fund headed up by Nate Anderson. Anderson is most famous for having released a video of a Nikola's electric truck prototype being towed up a hill in order to be pushed down to make a promotional video showing that the technology was fully operational. Trevor Milton, the CEO of Nikola, was convicted of fraud partially based upon this evidence. It's not just stocks they investigate either. Last year, Hindenburg investigated a Ponzi scheme operator, and because there was no way to short the Ponzi scheme, which was not publicly traded, Anderson's company filed a whistleblower claim with the SEC, putting it in a position to be paid should the agency recover significant funds in a case. Anderson also submitted Hindenburg's report for consideration for the Pulitzer Prize in investigative journalism because why not? As I mentioned, Hindenburg does have a short position on Adani Group companies and hopes to profit from the fall in the price of their stocks and bonds based on the fraudulent activity he claims to have unearthed it. Now, Hindenburg is not the first to point out all of these issues at Adani Group. There have been questions about Adani for quite some time. Analysts, investors and journalists have raised questions about the level of leverage in these firms and whether earnings growth was sufficient to support these extremely high valuations. They've also pointed out that the company's shareholder registers contain many funds that rarely sell Adani stock and hold little of anything else. Credit Suisse warned in a 2015 report entitled House of Debt that the Adani Group was one of 10 conglomerates under severe stress that accounted for 12% of banking sector loans in India. Despite these concerns, the Adani Group has been able to keep raising funds, in part by borrowing from overseas lenders and pivoting to green energy. India overtook Italy, France and the UK in the last decade to become the world's fifth largest economy. This is partially because many see it as a safer alternative to investing in China, given Beijing's tensions with the United States. Indian stocks are expensive. The MSCI India Index, at 24 times earnings, trades at an over 50% premium to the Global Stock Index. Adani Group companies are even more expensive than the average Indian stock. 
The biggest seven Adani companies have an average multiple of 375 times earnings. They've risen fast too. Before the report came out, Adani Green Energy had risen 900% over the prior three years. Adani Enterprises has seen revenues rise over the last 20 years, but profitability has lagged, partially because a lot of capital was reinvested in the business, but partially because it's in low margin businesses. Low margin businesses don't normally trade at such a premium. Adani's growth has been funded almost entirely with debt, and the pace of borrowing increased as Adani pushed into new sectors like 5G and green hydrogen. The group's debt doubled over the last four years. There does, however, seem to have been a shift to equity in the last year or so, driven by lender concerns about leverage and a high market price. To reduce concerns about its debt, the Adani Group had started turning to issuing equity to global investors, including the share sale that Hindenburg interrupted with their report. Now, the Hindenburg report came out at a very sensitive moment for Gautam Adani. It was released on the very morning when Adani was launching a $2.5 billion share offering. The share sale was designed to show the broader appeal of the Adani Group, which, while very expensive, is thinly traded and mostly held by related entities, opaque offshore funds and state-controlled funds such as the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. This share sale was being pitched to international investors after shares in Adani Enterprises had surged more than 3,300% in three years. It was claimed that the equity issue was being done to both reduce leverage and to increase the amount of freely traded shares. The new shares were being offered at a small discount to the market price. In order for the share offering to succeed, the existing shares needed to be trading above the value that these new shares had been priced at. Otherwise, no one would want to buy them. Once the report came out, right before the stock offering, the share price began to tumble. India's flagship company had been hit and was listing. The scandal pushed the share price down below the level of the new share offering. This should have ended the deal altogether, but surprisingly, despite it making absolutely no sense, Adani was able to sell the entire $2.5 billion worth of stock. So who would buy these new shares at a premium when they could buy the existing shares in the market at a much lower price? Things were getting pretty strange. On day one, institutional investors who had already subscribed were taking up $750 million of the shares. This had been agreed in advance. On day two, the retail offering, nobody was interested. Only 1% of the available shares were taken up. And why would you buy them? People weren't even interested in the existing shares available on the stock exchange, which were trading cheaper. On day three, the international holding company of Abu Dhabi pledged to buy $400 million worth of shares, and this somewhat changed the market mood. They were willing to pay 10 to 20% more than the price in the open market, and this was a strong show of support. On the final day, the day the deal had to be completed, the stock price stayed below the offering price. It looked like the deal would be a failure. Just before the market closed, a note went out that the offering was fully subscribed. So who were the last buyers? The FT reported that brokers were saying that there was strong demand from wealthy Indian investors. The rumor was that five of the largest buyers were the family offices of five of the largest tycoons in India. They were paying more than they would have had to. These are people who compete with each other every day in business, but seem to come together to defend one of their own against an outsider. India Inc. did not want one of its members attacked and brought down by a New York short seller. Shares in Adani Enterprises closed up almost 3% after the deal completion, but a lot of questions still remained. Things got stranger the next day, the price of Adani Enterprises 
continued to fall that day, even after the share sale was complete. Adani was forced to decide whether to saddle his investors with immediate losses and jeopardize his long-standing business relationships. He couldn't do it. He backtracked and canceled the sale. This decision only accelerated the panic over the financial health of Adani's empire. In a regulatory filing that evening, Adani said that given the unprecedented situation and the current market volatility, it was returning the proceeds and withdraws the completed transaction. Given the extraordinary fluctuations in its share price, the board felt that going ahead with the issue would not be morally correct. Now, how did Adani Group address the issues raised by Hindenburg? Well, they came out with a 413-page rebuttal, likening the Hindenburg report to an attack on India. The Adani Group firmly denied the accusations, calling them nothing but a lie from the Madoffs of Manhattan. While the report was 413 pages long, it seemed rushed out and didn't have an awful lot of detail. Adani just dismissed most of Hindenburg's questions as disproven and baseless allegations or misleading claims. The vast majority of the 413-page report was annex materials that didn't always seem relevant. Parts of the response even seemed to confirm some of Hindenburg's suspicions. For example, they argued that Vino Adani, Gautam's brother, was not a related party, and thus his transactions through shell companies didn't need to be disclosed, despite the fact that under Indian securities law, family members of company founders are classified as related parties. The head of legal at Adani Group announced that they were evaluating the relevant provisions under US and Indian laws for remedial and punitive action against Hindenburg research. Hindenburg promptly responded to the Adani statement, denying any wrongdoing and saying that the Indian conglomerate was using patriotic ties to avoid addressing serious issues. They said that fraud cannot be obfuscated by nationalism or a bloated response. They announced that they would welcome any legal action. If Adani is serious, it should also file suit in the United States where we operate, the short seller said. We have a long list of documents we would demand in a legal discovery process. On Monday this week, Adani announced the early repayment of a $1.1 billion share-backed loan, describing it as a proactive move to reduce leverage. It later came out that the lenders, which included Barclays, Citigroup and Deutsche Bank, had sent Adani a margin call equivalent to 50% of the loan in cash, as the collateral backing it had fallen so much in value. Rather than post cash against the loan, which did not mature until September of next year, Adani opted to repay the loan in full. Adani Group denied that they received a margin call. Right now, we don't know how this battle will work out. Bloomberg reports that there are many hedge funds taking the other side of the Hindenburg trade. They're buying up Adani stock and bonds, saying that the strong assets and cash flows of Adani's ports, power and green energy companies will ensure that the debt is serviced and that investors would be shielded from any losses resulting from any future defaults. Indian opposition MPs, who see a chink in Modi's armour, have demanded the country's market regulator and stock exchange address the allegations made by Hindenburg. The Securities and Exchange Board of India, India's SEC equivalent, said that it was aware of unusual price movement in the stocks of a business conglomerate and it would examine and take appropriate action if any information comes to their notice. SEBI has consistently followed this approach on entity level issues and would continue to do so, it said. This scandal has arrived at a big moment for India. Its economy is thriving, it's about to become the world's most populous nation, and it chairs the G20 group of leading economies. 
The fallout from this scandal obviously risks damaging the country's status as a top pick of emerging market investors who see Indian stocks as an alternative to the now uninvestable Chinese equities. India's benchmark Sensex index is not cheap though. It trades at three times book, double that of Chinese and Japanese counterparts. Whatever the merits of the Hindenburg report, it would be a mistake for India's business community to ignore this scandal and hope that it just goes away. India's growth story relies heavily on investor trust in transparency, governance, and the quality of its institutions. When accusations like these are made, these institutions need to be seen to take them seriously rather than sweeping them under the rug. The Adani Group's ability to keep raising money and service its debt is an open question right now. The group claims that they will have no difficulty meeting their debt obligations. Index provider MSCI last Saturday said it was closely monitoring Adani stocks and factors that might affect their eligibility for inclusion in its indices any change in which could have an effect on their share price. They announced on Wednesday that they're set to change their index weightings for Adani Group stocks after reviewing how many shares can be freely traded, saying that certain investors in Adani Group should no longer be designated as free float pursuant to our methodology, after receiving feedback from a range of market participants. Adani has paid down that $1.1 billion loan backed by shares in several of its companies that I mentioned earlier. So whether it was a margin call or not, Adani is deleveraging. His ports and logistics company have also announced plans to pay off more than $600 million of borrowing and to cut spending. Many are arguing that Adani would be best able to raise cash if needed by selling one or more of its ports, power plants or other assets, as returning to the stock market for another share sale is probably not an option given the recent events and the cloud hanging over the company. To quote a recent tweet from Aswat Damodaran on this topic, he says, This is Adani's story, but how India responds to it will affect the trajectory for the India story. It's a chance for Indian institutions, government regulators, banks, exchanges to start fixing their legacy problems. But those fixes will not be easy. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch this one next. Don't forget to check out today's video sponsor Blinkist by clicking on the link in the description below. Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Bye.